to be fairer yeah, than what right. we're living in now. Right. Hey? <laughs> wow. <laughs> this world, what a place to live. Have, have you started streaming yet? Yeah, we're live. So, you're about to go live. Oh, I was going to say. So we're still on the intro. No, 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 you're right. I just forgot to switch it over to you. No, I can't. There you are, you're on. <laughs> okay, good morning, everybody. Morning. Welcome along to Sunnybank today as we fellowship together and worship our glorious God and, and his dear son together. So great to be back together, uh, to see so many joyful faces, and yeah, just welcome to everybody. Uh, We've got somebody visiting for the first day. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome, dear brother. Yes. Great to have Graham along. Um, just warms my heart. Just warms my heart to, to have Graham with us and everybody else here with us as we, yeah, just fellowship and have a wonderful time together. Uh, for those that are joining us online, a special welcome as well. Okay, I'll give We're me the names. Not forgetting you. Cole's going to call your names out. Right, so we got Hanya. Morning, Hanya. We have Tracy. We have, I'm not sure who Blessed is, but Blessed, uh, Lorraine, Brad, all, all online, plus, plus Anonymous. Plus the... Plus Anonymous. Yes, many Anonymous. Plus Anonymous. anonymous. Yeah, Good old Anonymous. I'm Ronnie and Craig. It's plural, <laughs> it's, it's plural for a, a, Anonymous Anonymous. Oh, I thought so. <laughs> okay, so welcome to the Anonymous. Jenny, Jenny. Okay. Yeah, Jenny be on. Okay, all good. Yeah, so welcome to everybody. It's just always a just a privilege to have you with us, and I'm sure you'll be blessed as we are to today. Um, we're going to sing number 163 at the cross. That will be a bit of a theme for us today at the cross, the importance of the cross. And uh, number 163, take it away, Mrs. Music. foolishness to the Greeks and a stumbling block to the Jews the cross hmm the complexity of the cross when we don't understand it eh um, 
That's going to be our theme today. And we pray that the title of today's theme, of today's talk, is Harden Not Your Hearts. Okay, the theme for today is Harden Not Your Hearts. It's very easy when confronted with the cross to go, oh no. Okay, it's alright if it's somebody else's cross, but not if it's ours. So that's going to be sort of our theme for today. And so, yes, has everybody's been welcome, except for those who just walked through the door. <laughs> welcome to those who just walked through the door as well. Everybody who's just arrived, blessings to have you with us. And uh, I'll invite everyone to, to kneel and, uh, and we'll pray together. Oh, just a second, turn this on. Gracious Father, it's a privilege and a pleasure to come together again on the Sabbath as we worship you, as we are just so grateful for, for keeping us through the last six days and bringing us back to another day of rejoicing. Every day is a day of rejoicing, but the Sabbath is extra special because we can do it with, uh, together uh, with our brothers and sisters. And Father, uh, I find it a privilege to be here today with all these beautiful people. Father, your, your spirit has touched their hearts and drawn us all together. And we pray that as we fellowship with you and your son, that we will receive your spirit as well. That uh, our minds will be opened, that we'll receive your word with joy and thanksgiving. And that you might do your work in us that you have promised. Pray for all of those that are joining us as, as well uh, online uh, in faraway places. Father, bless them where they are and fill their hearts with, with your love and our love that they might know that they are loved and appreciated by people all around the world. And we thank you and dedicate this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So, up at, uh, up at our camp that we had not too long ago, uh, we were going through the book Agape in the first few chapters, all right, and uh, we, we got through to uh, number seven, we actually did do number seven, that was our final meeting together, and uh, I, I prepared something on it, but just the way things worked out, uh, somebody else took, took that lesson that day, which was great, we had a wonderful time together, we always do. And it was a big interactive uh, occasion because there was heaps of us there and, and yeah, it was beautiful. But like I said, I'd prepared something for, for that and it was a PowerPoint as well, which I like to do. And so I'm going to do that today, uh, more of a sermon kind of a style rather than a, a highly interactive style. Okay, so um, as you'll see, you've got the book cover there, Agape, the revelation of the Father's character of love. And then you've got the chapter titles on the right hand side and you've even got the page number page 55 so those of you that have the book that may not have read chapter 7 by all means when you go home whenever you've got a chance read that chapter and you can glean out of that uh, but for today i'm going to have a go at expressing my thoughts that i got out of reading that chapter so um, i hope we're all blessed by that I'm going to start with a with a quote which is becoming I guess very synonymous with myself I love this quote um, from Christ Object Lessons page 415 by way of introduction of course harden not your hearts that's the message we want to get out of this today that, that it is a possibility that even us now sitting here could one day harden our hearts to the gospel harden our hearts to the cross as we sit here we're like no that couldn't happen but wow not just this, this quote and what I've got, but I, I just thought of um, Great Controversy, page 608. Uh, for those of us that, are, that get together on a Monday morning and, and have our prayer meeting, we're going through the Great Controversy. And it talks to those about those who uh, once professed the, the belief in the third angel's message, but they weren't sanctified by the message. They eventually turned, turned away and joined the ranks of those that were opposed and it's like oh wow I don't want to do that because it's a distinct possibility that Gavin could turn okay distinct possibility in and of myself I know I would turn under pressure I'm really good at running 
Okay, that's one, of, yeah, that's one of the things I can do real good. Run away from pressure. But we don't want to do that when it comes to Christ, do we? We don't want to do that when it comes to the cross. And, and so in the light of that, harden not my heart, is I think is a very appropriate um, topic to look at today. So it's the darkness of misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. And we've discussed this before, so I won't unpack all of this. It has been misunderstood and misrepresented. So our, our God, our Father, is misunderstood and therefore misrepresented. At the, this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed, a message illuminating in its influence and saving in its power. His character is to be made known. Into the darkness of the world is to be shed the light of his glory, the light of his goodness, mercy and truth. So what is the light of God's glory? In three words here, goodness, mercy and truth. And where do we see the light of God's glory most beautifully manifested? In the face of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6. So not only is um, a message to be proclaimed illuminating in its influence and saving in its power, demonstrating and revealing God's character, but along with that, and this is what we're going to look at today, there has to be a message that parallels that, that is illuminating in its influence and saving in its power that shows Gavin his true character. Does that make sense? Because it's one thing to see God and appreciate God and go, oh, yeah, wonderful. But Gavin needs to change if he's going to witness about his wonderful father. And I believe we all need to do that. And we do know that when that happens, when the vessel is prepared, God's going to do marvelous things through his vessels. He's promised to do that, uh, which we don't necessarily see at the moment. Okay, so harden not your hearts. That's going to be the chapter we're looking at today. How easy would it be to harden our hearts to something new, not realizing the value of it? Okay, especially let's think spiritually. Let's think as Christians. Let's think of the messages that could possibly be brought to us that we may not have heard, be heard before. And uh, something new gets brought to our attention. And what's a very... Well, I want to ask a question. It is very common for us as Christians to be very comfortable in where we are and what we understand. That's just how we are. People are like that, not just Christians. It's just how we are as people. We get in a comfort zone and that's cool. And then when something new comes along that could possibly be like, um, you might need to change your ways, your thinking, your you know, understanding. It's just like, whoa, 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 whoa. And it's really hard. Um, and so that's what we want to look at to today as we go through this lesson, uh, firstly, this isn't talking. Can you hit escape and go back in and hit the little projector screen? Hit, hit escape on the laptop. Why is that? It's working now. Okay, yeah, good. it's not on the projector screen, that's all, that's why it's different, that's why the um, icons are showing at the bottom of the screen there. Oh, so, okay, so what do you want me to do? Hit escape. Escape? Right, and go in the little projector screen down the bottom, right. Oh, I've got to unplug that because that doesn't work while I've got that plugged in. Oh, it's gone, I think I've just made a mistake. Because I shouldn't have unplugged that. That's the problem. Okay, yeah, PowerPoint's good now. <sighs> See if that's still there. Okay, so we'll just bring it back to speed. Yep. Sorry for that, my dear ones. Okay. So. Did the leaders of Israel have um, this problem when hearing Jesus? They heard something new. They heard something new coming from Jesus, his doctrine, his the principles of God's kingdom, and everything that he was expressing was just brand new to them. Yes, they had a problem with that. 
And uh, Jesus mentioned a couple of very strong points in relationship to that because their response to this new information was quite strong. John chapter 7 verse 19 says, Did not Moses give you the law and yet none of you keeps the law? I mean, these guys were like number one at keeping the law, weren't they? The Pharisees? They, they would have just, yeah, ticking all the boxes. They were professionals at keeping the law. He says, um, Moses gave you the law, but none of you actually keep it. And they would have been like, what do you mean? And it's like, well, why do you go about to kill me? And if I haven't got verse 20 on, on here, but in verse 20 of John 7, he says, and the people answered, you've got a devil. Who's going about to kill you? They couldn't believe it. Like, us? No. We're not, going to, we're not planning to kill you. So there's a denial of the spirit that was in their heart. We also find in John chapter 8, verse 37, um, and this is after the experience with uh, the woman that was caught in adultery. They were very condemning people, weren't they? And they wanted Jesus to, to um, confirm their, their um, zealous spirit of condemnation, and he didn't. But at the end of that, there was a discussion that went on, and just verse 37, I know that you are Abraham's seed, physically, you know, in the flesh, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Now, that's an important lesson. If God's word is not in us, there will be another spirit that will take over, and when that spirit has complete control, it's the spirit of a murderer, isn't it? A mur liar and a murderer from the beginning that was in Cain. And so that, that is what is naturally within Gavin. Okay, that might be a shock to you. Think, oh, wow, we're, we're fellowshipping with a guy that's really dark. Well, the Bible says we're all dark. We're all dark if left to our, ourselves. And, and the good news is that Jesus is the light and brings light into our lives. So, yeah, that was 37. And verse 40, But now you seek to kill me, a man that has told you the truth. truth. So the spirit that is not in harmony with God, that is, that is not from God, the spirit that pushes back against God's word will eventually have a spirit of murder. We as Christians need to watch this because we do see in Revelation, don't we? We see a system in Revelation of a bunch of Christians at the end that will actually turn to murder in order to defend God's kingdom. It's like, whoa, I don't want to be a part of that. All right. Oh, yeah. So now, did the disciples have a problem with hearing Jesus as well? Yes, yes we've discussed that in the past as well. They had a big problem, and we're really going to look at that today in Luke chapter 9. Jesus is saying one thing, and it's just not getting through to the disciples. And again, this is a problem that, that Gavin has, that he reads something, he hears something, and sometimes I might even go, oh, yeah, that's wonderful, but I can turn around and, and forget the face I saw in the mirror. That's how quick I can forget the lessons that I learn. And so this is where God's grace is so important in teaching us. And some of the best lessons learned in life, take time to learn, don't they? And they're the best lessons. The, the lessons that we learn um, over time, they go deep into our heart. And so is it possible that we could have the same problem as the leaders did back in the day and as the disciples did back in the day? And of course we can say absolutely yes to that. So we go back to Psalm 95 and verse 8 through 10 here. It says, to harden not your heart, as in the day of provocation, as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, when your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my work. So did they see what God was able to do? Big time. They saw God's work amazingly in front of, more than what I have. They saw an incredible manifestation of God's work. Forty years was I grieved with this generation that saw my work and said, it's a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Um, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking that 
a lot of the time we look at something and we think, hmm, there's a, th- a, a distinct theological difference and I don't understand or they don't understand me and it's just about theology um, and, and so that's why we speak different things or understand different things. But is it possible that the reason we have different theologies is because of our hearts, that we're not hearing God's word, that our hearts aren't prepared to hear God's word and therefore the theology we think, ah, oh, it's, it's just because I don't understand it or, you know, you've mis- misrepresented it or whatever, and, and we blame the other person or blame someone, um, anyone but me, uh, for not understanding. And, but it's actually my heart that's not ready for it. And I've, I've said before, many, many years ago, a brother told me about the message of the Father and the Son. My heart wasn't ready for it back then. Just wasn't ready for it. But now it's a different story. And so, so the, the, the heart, and my heart was hardened back then. By God's grace, it didn't go through the process of becoming um, petrified wood that hard. It um, was softened. God still worked with me, and, and that's good news for us as we're dealing with other people. That um, although there might be an apparent hardness towards what we're saying at this point, we just need to keep praying and just keep working because all of our hearts were softened, weren't they? And, and, and that's how God works. Um, so even when yeah, truth's put in front of us, if we've got the hard heart, we won't hear it. Uh, and sometimes it's uh, our self-desire, our, our own desires, our um, ambitions, worldly ambitions and things like that, that we hear something that's like, well, if I accept that, then that will mean I'll have to do, th- and I won't be able, oh boy, no, 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 that, that can't be the truth. That, that can't be the truth. And we justify not accepting a truth based on not actually the theology itself, but our heart and our desires. And we just push back on that. Again, God is wonderfully gracious and he doesn't give up uh, just because of that. Uh, if, if it was only about theology, if it was only about being clever, it was, if it was only about being the smartest people understand the kingdom of God, then who would Jesus have had as his disciples? The, the Pharisees, the scribes, you know, all, all the people at the, at the top of the leadership in Israel because they were the smartest. I mean, they knew the law back the front. Some of them could just quote it and quote it and quote it and quote it. But when Jesus came along with this new light, they had no idea what he was talking about. And as they got harder and harder in their hearts, so was their desire to push him away eventually to the point, as Jesus mentioned on several occasions, you actually want to kill me. No, wouldn't do that. Um, Yes, we would. Yes, we would. But the good news is that later on, after Jesus' cross, after the cross, notice this important point, after the cross and after the resurrection, there were people like Nicodemus, Joseph of Arimathea, and then after many more years, Paul of Tarsus that actually joined and it wasn't because they became cleverer and went oh yes we finally figured out the theology it's actually their hearts were touched by the beautiful Jesus and they finally understood wow that there's principles here that we just we were never taught We, we didn't understand it but they changed and that's the good news all right So if it, it's not possible, we, we know the scripture that says to, to take up our cross, and we're going to look at that today, take up the cross and follow Jesus. Um, it's impossible to take up our cross if we don't actually understand what it means. If we don't really understand what the cross means, then what are we taking up? We might have a form of a cross, we might wear a cross, we might paint a cross, stick a cross on a wall, we can do all sorts of things with a cross, but if we don't really understand what the cross means, spiritually significantly means then how can we take take our cross up that's why it's an important message for me messages of every order and kind have been urged upon seventh day adventists to pl- take place of the truth which point by point has been sought out by prayer and or prayerful study 
and testified to by the miracle working power of the Lord. So, how did Adventists get all of their points? Just by being smart? Prayerful study. Prayerful study. Testified by, miracle. testified by the miracle working power of the Lord. Do you know the Lord himself, the Spirit of the Lord, was behind the beginning of our movements and its gradual development in its understanding. Okay, that, that's a really significant point. But the, the way marks which have made us what we are, these certain understandings, these certain teachings that have made us what we are as Seventh-day Adventists, are to be preserved. And they will be preserved, Sister White writes. And I'll say today, they have been preserved. Okay, they may not be on everybody's front shelf in the, you know, in, in, in the cupboard in, in where they have all the preserve, preserved products, spiritually speaking, but they have been preserved. They are out there. They are available still. Amen? It's very important to remember. The way marks which have made us what we are are to be preserved and they will be preserved as God has signified through his word and the testimony of his spirit. That's a strong little statement. Guarantee. When God signifies it and he testifies to it that these things are going to be preserved, that means, are they available for us today? They're available for us today. The things which made us Seventh-day Adventists are available to us today. He calls upon us to hold firmly with the grip of faith to the fundamental principles that are based upon unquestionable authority. And... Uh, those of you that have done a bit of homework would understand that the fundamental principles were first written in 1872 and printed in 1874. That's what she's referring to. Today we have fundamental beliefs. Okay, and if you compare the two, there are differences. But in this statement, it's saying the point, the, the truth, which point by point has been sought by prayerful study and testified by the miracle working power of the Lord, um, those fundamental principles, those way marks will be preserved and they're available for us today. So that's just an encouragement to at least compare them. Anybody that's listening to this sermon online in the future, at least compare them and have a look at the differences. When men come in who would move one pin or pillar from the foundation which God has established by a bunch of clever people, no, his by His Holy Spirit, then let the aged men, and now these were the men that God led point by point, who when they were young were prayerfully studying together, let these aged men who were pioneers in our work speak plainly, and let those who are dead speak also by the reprinting of their articles in our periodicals. Okay, how many people are making or, or taking advantage of these assets? The writings of these aged, aged men who were the pioneers and those that have passed to the grave. Well, they've all passed to the grave now. Gather up the rays of divine light. That's what she calls these writings. Gather up the rays of divine light that God has given as he has led his people on step by step in the way of truth. How good is God? This truth will stand the test of time and trial. Boy, is there going to be some trials coming against those truths. And anybody that happens to hold to them. Devil doesn't like it. And he will deceive even who? The very elect Jesus said. Matthew 24, over and over, to be careful. So I just put that in context. And, and the reason I put that there was because a, a lot of the teachings that came through that time, especially that time period, 1888 to 1895, a lot of those teachings that were developing and brought forward are very significant in the preparation of our characters for the last days. Not just the theology of state of the dead and the Sabbath and you know some of those theological things, but there was the, the theology of the Bible actually is to come home. It's to come home to our hearts, to touch us here, so that we can be fitted to be vessels used by the Lord in a mighty way. 
That's why it's all in, so important what they were teaching. Okay, so we move on now to Luke chapter 9. And, and this, is, this is where uh, chapter 7 of the Agape book starts to come alive. It came to pass, as he was alone praying with his disciples, that is Jesus, praying with his disciples, uh, praying, his disciples were with him. And he asked them, saying, Whom do people say that I am? Who do they say that I am? Then they answering said, Well, John the Baptist. Some say Elias, which is Elijah. Others say that one of the old prophets has risen again. Wow, that's interesting theology <laughs> for a Jew. <laughs> State of the dead. And then, so Jesus said to them, uh, but who, who do you say that I am? Okay, everybody's got different opinions. Everybody's a little bit confused. Who do you say that I am? And Peter said, the Christ of God. That's, that's how Luke records it. The Christ of God. But if we go across to Matthew chapter 16, same conversation, just recorded by somebody else, he actually uh, expands what was said that day. And Simon Peter answering said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Wow, now that's a powerful statement. And so Jesus then answers that and he says to him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed it to you, but my Father which is in heaven. So here, here we have an amazing situation where, where Jesus says, and I'll just put this up, the Father and Son relationship has been revealed. By whom? Revealed by the Father. Revealed to whom? To Peter. And so how, how did the Father get this message through to Peter? Text message, was it? Okay, letter, stamped, sealed, delivered? No. Um, Holy Spirit. The Spirit of the Father spoke, according to Jesus, it was the Spirit of the Father who spoke to Peter and gave him this revelation, and Jesus confirms it as a true revelation. Because he said, you didn't get that because you went to theology class. You didn't get that because your group of friends uh, uh, just happened to, to stumble upon this. Uh, and they agree with you or whatever. Um, no, 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 my Father has revealed this. And so just as the Holy Spirit led in the early Adventist church, well, that's a reflection of what the Holy Spirit was doing way back with Peter. Uh, the Holy Spirit has never changed. Always available. And so... What became interesting is back to Luke... Luke chapter 9, verse 21 now. Straight after Peter says this, Jesus says, And he straightly charged them and commanded them to tell no man that thing. Wow. you think this would be the thing you'd be wanting him to run around and shout to everybody. <laughs> like, you just had this revelation from the Father. Jesus has just confirmed <laughs> this was from God. But, shh. Why? Why not run around and tell everybody? Wasn't quite the time. There's a time for all things. Okay? At that time, it wasn't the time. And he goes on in verse 22, and he says, The Son of Man must suffer many things, and be rejected of the elders, and the chief priests, and the scribes, and be slain, and be raised the third day. Now, They've just had this wonderful, glorious news revealed by God. And in the next breath, Jesus is just like, he, he changes the temperature of the mood. Ah, oh, the Son of Man must suffer many things. Be rejected by ev everybody who's anybody with, within the religious community in high places. They're all going to reject me. And they're actually going to kill me but I'll be raised the third day. If the disciples were anything like me, if I hear suffering, rejected, and killed, my brain's locked into those three words, I may not have heard the, the fourth bit. 
raised the third day. There's a distinct possibility. That, that, have you ever been in a conversation and someone's talking to you and before they finish their sentence you're thinking about what you're going to say? Yes. How are you going to answer them? I know in Gavin's experience, if I do that, I don't hear the rest of the sentence. As soon as I lock into my thoughts on the first part, I don't hear the second. I can't do that. And so this might have been what the disciples did. But that was the first warning. This is the first time Jesus is beginning to introduce the warning of the cross. The cross is coming. I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be rejected by everybody who's anybody. And I'm going to be slain. And raise the third day. So the cross gets introduced now and the disciples now are confronted with a reality that they're not real comfortable with. And so back to Matthew recording this. Then Peter took him, took Jesus, and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine that? <laughs> the boldness and the audacity of this dear Peter to take his creator, his Lord, his master, his teacher, his best friend that he's been hanging around with and, and rebukes him. Lord, no, be it far from you. This shall not be unto you. I'm sure he didn't say it in a, a aggressive, nasty, angry manner, but it was still a rebuke, like, no, this cannot happen, Lord. He probably meant it in love, in his own form of love, in his own understanding of love. No, Lord, I want to protect you. Nothing's going to happen to you. He may not have heard the bit about being raised the third day. I'm going to protect you. In protecting from the first three things, it would have been a, a, a delay of the fourth thing. And prophetically, as we understand Daniel, there was actually a timing involved in as well, wasn't there? To fulfill all prophecy. So bless Peter, he's trying to stop prophecy from being fulfilled, if you, if you think about it like that. And so Jesus responds. He turned and he said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. And it's just like, whack! You are an offence to me, for you savour not the things that be of God, but that those that be of men. And again, I believe that Peter was doing it from the sincerity of, his, sincerity of his heart to protect his Lord, but he just didn't understand the deeper things. He didn't understand these deeper things. And, and I believe that's the same with us. It, uh, we don't understand God's purposes. We, we struggle to understand God's purposes for ourselves. Well, I'll say for me. I understand it. I fail to understand God's purposes for me most of the time. And then for me to think that I understand the timing and the purposes of God's work in other people's lives would, would really be um, wrong. I'll just say it simple, be wrong. And so sometimes we just need to, to share and let God's spirit do the convicting in his own time. But anyway, the point being um, is that Peter's will not was, was not in harmony with God's will. Peter's understanding was not in harmony with God's understanding. So there was the first warning, but then there was the first hardening. No, you're not going to go to the cross. Because the, the cross cuts against everything that I understand and believe in about you, about the Messiah. And therefore also about, you remember what was in the background? We'll, we'll look at it later on. About their roles within this kingdom that they believed was coming. And so there was a first hardening of their hearts against the cross. Back to Luke, verse 23, 9, 23. And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? That's you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and so here we have Jesus raising the, the, the issue of self-denial. We, we have to deny ourselves sometimes. 
and especially when it comes to the point of taking up the cross. If we don't understand the cross, we certainly won't want to take it up. But if we understand the cross, we will see it as a vital thing to take it up. Because at the end of the day, it was vital for our salvation that Christ took up the cross. How we understand that may differ widely. But taking up the cross was about demonstrating humility and submission and love and revealing that to the people. So that they could see that God was not like they thought he was, which was our first quote, misapprehension, misunderstanding of God. So, if, if at the back of our minds we are thinking worldly prosperity, worldly honour, worldly ambition, uh, and allowing that to get in front of us, as opposed to what God wants to lead us to, major problem. And if those same problems enter into the church, where it's not, where we, we think it's spiritual ambition, spiritual prosperity, etc., um, to, to, to be a leader, to be in control, etc., um, that also could get in the way of the cross. Okay? Jesus wanted and had to teach the disciples some amazing lessons of humility and self denial before he could let them go free on the world to take the gospel. Because if they were allowed to take the gospel in the state that they were in, that wouldn't have rep represented and reflected God appropriately, would it? And I take that upon myself as well. If I was let loose on the world, oh boy, how I would misrepresent my father. And so I'm still going through the process. That's the point. Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed. And when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. But I tell you of a truth, there be some standing here that shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. And that's good news. If we, if we look at that literally, you won't die before you see the kingdom of God. Spiritually, you will not die until you see the kingdom of God. Oh. Did they see the kingdom of God? Did they see the kingdom of God before they died, the disciples? Yeah. Some did. Yeah. Yeah. And when did they see the kingdom of God? At the cross. They saw the kingdom of God, the principles of the kingdom of God, in Jesus in that last 24 hours of his life. And wow, was that finally a lesson after three, three and a half years of hanging out with Jesus. In the last 24 hours, they're like, ting, lesson, ting, lesson. Whoa, they started to see the principles of God's kingdom just lit up in front of them. Praise God they didn't taste death until they saw the kingdom. Because that was what converted them. The cross converted them. The goodness of God revealed on the cross in Christ converted them. So they were called to take up their cross. They had hardened their hearts. They didn't want it to happen. But Jesus introduces, no, no, this is an important lesson. Verse 28. And it came to pass about eight days after these sayings that he took Peter and John and James and went up into the mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his raiment was white and glistening. Okay, the transfiguration. What an what a experience that must have been. And so who shows up? Behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah. So now we have, and it's interesting, it's on the back of these experiences that they've just been through, where their hearts are starting to harden towards the cross, that God sends messengers from heaven. Wow. Does the Father care? <laughs> Big time. And so Moses and Elijah come, and then what do they talk about? It says, verse 31, who appeared in glory. So they would have been shining, and like they've been hanging out with the angels and God in heaven. They would have been shining in unreal. 
They appeared in glory and spoke of his decease, which he would accomplish at Jerusalem. It's like, you've got nothing better to talk about, really. <laughs> you come all the way from heaven to talk about Jesus dying, and Peter's already said, no, no, you're not going to die. No, God forbid that you should die. And, the, and Moses and Elijah come down and go, uh, we're here to encourage you. We're, we're in here, here, sent by the Father to let you know, yes, this is the way. This is the way that will be the answer to all the questionings in the universe. This will be the way that you destroy the devil. The cross is the way. Hey, we're already in heaven. We're, we're already re results. You know, and they might have mentioned Enoch. Enoch's sort of still up there. You know, we are the results of this work that you're that you've been doing for four thousand years, and you're you're about to just like stamp it and seal it in front of everyone's eyes. Like, you can you can do it. We're here. You know, we know how hard it is, and they could go through their experiences, Moses' experiences, Elijah's experiences. I know what it's like to have millions of people following me and not listening and blaming me for everything. You know, Moses could have brought that out and talked about it, and Elijah, oh, you know, the things that I did, but whatever. But you gave me victory. And they encouraged him and spoke of his decease. Verse 32, But Peter and they that were with him were heavy with sleep, isn't that easy to do? Someone's talking about God. So easy to fall asleep. Whether it's in front of the TV, the computer, the YouTube, or sometimes even in a church. We sit there and we're listening to words and, hey, just something happens and we start to drift. These guys started to drift. They started to get sleepy in the presence of Moses and Elijah and Jesus in all this glory. And it's like, oh boy, God's good for putting some of these stories in there. Because these guys that were sleepy became the movers and shakers of the gospel after Jesus was resurrected. Hope for us? There's hope for us. And it came to pass as they departed from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here and to make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Again, bless his heart. He saw all the glory, he, 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 he saw all this, and he's like, wow, let's build tabernacles and, you know. I guess he missed the part about the decease, that Jesus was going to the cross. Bless his heart. While he thus spoke, there came a cloud and overshadowed them, and they feared as they entered into the cloud. So Moses and Elijah have gone back, now a cloud moves across. Hey, we've heard of that before, haven't we? And there came a voice out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Who's speaking? The Father. He sent representatives from heaven. And now, and if you go, yeah, he spoke to Peter personally. Then he spoke to, um, through Moses and Elijah, representatives from heaven. And the disciples were still struggling. And the Father says, I'll come myself. He comes down and speaks. This is my beloved son. Hear him. Keep listening, guys. Don't give up. Keep listening. And when the voice was passed, Jesus was found alone. And they kept it close and told no man in those days any of those things which they had seen. But it was an experience that they would never forget. It was something that they could call on later on. And speak with authority. And I, it was John recorded in First John. That's which we've seen, that which we've heard. Touched. Felt. Handled. Seen with our own eyes. That we testify. Is it John or Peter? First John 1, 1 and 2. 1, 1 and 2. Oh yeah, there it is. That which we're in the beginning. We've heard, we've seen with our eyes, we've looked upon. Our hands have handled of the word of life. Yeah. Beautiful message. So they, they might not have got everything out of that experience at that point, but they got a lot to take home and, as it were, put in the cupboard of the heart, ready for another day. And again, same for us. We can do exactly the same thing. God doesn't give up on us so easy. And of course, Neither does Jesus. And so again and again, just trying to reiterate, guys, there's some dark, dark, dark times ahead of us. 
It's interesting that the disciples didn't ask, how can we prepare for this? What should we do? They didn't ask that question, how can we prepare? They just tried to avoid it. Um, so the Father invites them, that's point number five. <clears throat> Steps to Christ, page 14, and second paragraph. None but the Son of God could accomplish our redemption. For only he who was in the bosom of the Father could declare him. Only he who knew the height and the depth of the love of God could make it manifest. Nothing less than the infinite sacrifice made by Christ in behalf of fallen man could express the appeasement to the Father. Oh, sorry, I think I misread that. Um, could take that back? I misread it. Made by Christ, the infinite sacrifice made by Christ in behalf of fallen man could express the Father's love to lost humanity. He humbled himself and died, demonstrating the principles of the kingdom of heaven. An infinite sacrifice. When we see Christ on the cross, we see the Father on the cross. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And the Father just wants us to know, I am not about punishing you. Doesn't matter what you do to me, doesn't matter what you do to my son, I am not going to be vengeful in the way that you understand vengeance. That's not my way. My way, what is it, what's that verse? Um, esteem other better than self. You read that in the Bible? Is that only for us? Or does that come from the principles of God's kingdom? Does it come from God? It comes from God. God esteems us better than himself. Whoa, is that a statement? And how do we know that? Because he sent it, so loved us that he sent his son to show us exactly what he's like. And Jesus said, he that's seen me, seen the Father. Jesus esteems us more important than self. He could have just wiped us. Oh, just start again. But he wouldn't wipe us. He would humble himself. And so he says, when he comes to the disciples, listen, this is my beloved son who I'm, who I'm well pleased. Listen to my boy. Listen to Jesus. Just keep reading. Just keep reading the Bible. Just keep reading the Gospels. Keep reading his words through Peter, James, John, Paul. And you'll see the voice of Jesus coming through. So we move from that experience to the next one. The disciples are still struggling with hard hearts. And it came to pass on the next day, when the people were come down from the hill, that much people met him. And behold, a man of the company cried out, saying, Master, I beseech thee, look upon my son, for he's my only child. And lo, a spirit takes him, and he suddenly cries out, and it tears him, that he foams again, and bruising him, hardly departs from him. And I besought your disciples to cast him out, and they couldn't do it. And Jesus answering said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and suffer you? Bring your son here. And as he was yet coming, the devil threw him down and tore him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the child and delivered him again to his father. And so the question, why couldn't the disciples do anything to help this little child? Because he was going to be helped. We know that God's will was that he was to be helped because Jesus helped him. Jesus rescued him. Jesus freed him. So why couldn't the disciples... We know the answer, because of the hardness in their heart that was still there. They were Jesus' best friends. They were his closest friends. They had been taught by the Master himself. 
but they were still in the process of having hard hearts and not understanding that. And if God was to perform miracles through people that were hard-hearted and had a different agenda than God's, then he would confirm that he accepts principles other than that of his own kingdom. That's what, he, that's what that would confirm. And that's why the devil lo loves to perform miracles in Christian churches. Because then Christians don't need to move. When something big happens in our life, and a miracle takes place, and we believe it's of God, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, I'm not here to judge, I, I don't know. But when something takes place that is miraculous, there could always be the temptation to think, I don't need to move any further. Because God sees me in a good enough position spiritually to start doing marvelous things through me. So I don't need to change. Could that be a stumbling block to moving forward into more truth? Yep. And I, I know our dear brothers and sisters in many of the Sunday churches that have lots of miracles every Saturday night and sometimes on a Sunday find it very difficult to move into a new understanding of theology because of their hearts that are God accepts us where we're at. We don't need to move. Because you can you do this? Gavin, can you do this? Do you speak in can you Hey? Hey? We've got the Spirit. And so that stops them moving along. And so God here in this circumstance, the disciples weren't able to change this boy's life. They still had hardness of hearts. Alright? But Jesus was able to heal this child. Ongoing, ongoing unbelief is now being manifested all right, by stopping them from performing a miracle on this child. Ongoing unbelief is manifested. All of the first five points are now coming out in point number six. Their Christian experiences it was limited to themselves. They weren't able at this point to be a benefit to others out there. 43, and they were all amazed at the mighty power of God, but while they wondered, everyone, everyone at all, the, all things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, let these sayings sink down into your ears. We could say into your heart. For the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. So after this experience, Jesus brings back the cross. Let, let these things sink down into your hearts. What you were not able to do, okay, let this sink down. Now let me just reintroduce the cross. I will be delivered into the hands of men. The point being here in Luke chapter 9, that Jesus is bringing out again and again the importance of the cross experience. Verse 45, but again they understood not, and it was hidden from them, and they perceived it not, and they feared to ask him of the saying. They didn't want to talk about it. They didn't understand, but they didn't want to talk about it. Anybody had that experience with their friends in the church? They don't really understand you, but they don't want to talk to you? Yes. May we not be like that. May we always be open to talk to people. To understand us, to learn about us, to learn about what we believe and share. Did that yesterday afternoon with a with a brother and sister uh, from, yeah, from another church and had, had a, a great three and a half hours together. Um, we walked away, not understanding everything exactly the same, but we had a beautiful opportunity to share our hearts with each other and share how we understand our Father, our God, His Spirit, and, and, and we separated just, it was beautiful, a beautiful afternoon. So we continue to pray for these people. It's just a joy to sit with people and discuss God's word. You know, the end result, that's in God's keeping. That's up to God when it all takes place. So here we have a second warning of the cross. And the disciples still, their hearts are hardening they're still not understanding, and now they're not even, they don't even want to talk about it. They're still not wanting to talk about it. They're getting harder and harder. And, and of course, we just keep applying these lessons to ourselves. 
Then there arose a reasoning among them which of them should be the greatest. And as I read this, I laughed. I'm like, they've just, they've just failed at helping this little boy that's got a, this evil spirit that was in him. They've, they've just met, like, I'm just speaking common language, but they just messed up big time, huh? And, and, and I'm no better, so don't get me wrong, but I'm just telling the story. They messed up big time of this little boy and they couldn't help him. And in the next couple of verses, there rose a reasoning. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? You or me? I think they're talking about the wrong stuff, weren't they? Who's going to be the greatest? And Jesus, perceiving their thought of their heart, here we go again. They're still having little mini heart attacks. Look, took a child and set him by them and said to them, it's interesting he took a child because it was just a child that they couldn't help. And Jesus takes another child and introduces another child and says, look at this little fella. He set the child by him and he said to them, whosoever shall receive this child in my name receives me. And he that, sorry, and whosoever receives me receives him that sent me. For he that is least among you, the same shall be great. He just, he, he just reinterprets great. <laughs> New dictionary, the, G, the Jesus dictionary. Great means he that is the least. What? You ever read in the Bible, my thoughts are not your thoughts, therefore, you know, uh, your ways are not my ways. And Jesus is like, he rewrites the dictionary. Great in the kingdom like this little child, the least. And Gavin's like, oh, far out. Boy, this is different. But it's a lesson. It's a lesson to be learned. We're here for each other, aren't we, at the end of the day? We're not here for self. It's not about us. It's about serving. And if you're an elder, it's about serving others. It's about helping others. It's about teaching. And if there's anything that we elders should be really good at, it's teaching. And you know why? Because we've made more mistakes than anybody else. Whoa, that was appropriate timing. Oh, that was a telephone. It wasn't one of the members. Okay. And so that's why we can teach, I believe, is because we've made more mistakes than anybody else. That is honest. That is the truth. And so what I'm sharing is just Gavin's experience of failure and reading the scriptures and going... Praise God. Because the way that Jesus handled the disciples, the way that his father handled the disciples, is the way that he's been handling me and being patient. So what should that teach me when dealing with people? Same thing. Just to be patient. And he said, Verily I say to you, except you be converted and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same shall... It's so the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The selfish ambition was growing and Jesus is trying to nip it in the bud. Just nip it in the bud. That's what he's trying to do. You've got to stop this because if this gets loose in my kingdom, it's going to bring my kingdom down. Have we noticed that during the last 2000 years? When, when Christian leaders take total control of everybody else, how they think, what they do, etc., etc., you know, take the gospel to the whole world and go around and we have inquisitions and all sorts of stuff to bring people into understanding that they have um, selfish ambition. We're doing this for God's kingdom, you know. And I've read in, 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 in the books, in the books, if we, and it's not a, it's not a quote, but a paraphrase, Basically, the principle was, if we um, uh, basically it was, if they can take somebody's life, if they can threaten somebody's life who didn't believe what they believed, and in the process of taking their life, torturing is the word, if if we if we torture them, and that torture brings them to repentance then we have saved their soul for eternity. So torture is an important aspect of taking the gospel to the world. When I read that in their books, I'm like, oh, that's not the kingdom of Jesus. 
selfish ambition grows, some of the things that have come out amongst Christian people, no wonder people don't like Christianity. Let's never let that happen. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in your name. Oh, next step. Anyone not against us? It's for us, Jesus had to respond. And John answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in your name. We, we saw it. And we forbade him. Huh? Because he didn't follow us. He's not following us. And it's like, I think they forgot that they couldn't even help the little boy. And this person's actually casting out demons. It's like, but they're not on our side. They haven't been following us. They're not walking with us. They don't believe what we believe. Well, I think they do. And what's Jesus' response? He said, forbid him not. Forbid them not. What, what they're doing is not your business. For he that is not against us is for us. There's, a, there's quite the lesson there. And so now, after all of the hardening of the hearts, the, the, the denial of the cross, the inability to help this boy, not wanting to talk about it. Now they want to stop other people from having an experience. Interesting. And Jesus said, don't worry about them. Don't try and stop them from doing what they're doing. They have a right to do what they're doing. If they're not against us, that's good news. Isn't that good news? They're not against us. They've got to be for us. The spirit of dominance was now appearing. And now they start heading north. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. And sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready. So they're, they're heading towards Jerusalem. They're coming through Samaria. And they said, look, go and, go and prepare a place. And what happens is the people in Samaria did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And they're like, oh, so you're not going to stay here. You don't want to spend some quality time with us. Well, you might as well just keep going. We don't have a place for you. And when the disciples, James and John, saw this, what were they, sons of what? Thunder. Okay, drum roll. Thunder. When the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, you know, after all their failure, after all the hard-heartedness that's been going on, the failure with the little boy, they couldn't help anybody, trying to shut somebody else down that's doing a different gospel work, they, um, they hear people rejecting Jesus. Not offering a place to stay. And they're like, Were you, Lord, were you that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? Huh? Now, now we'll show you that we're on your side. Even as Elias did. Oh, let's get rid of these people. Just, wow, that'll show that we're on your side, Lord. And they just would have been really happy with that statement. We'll show him. We care about his kingdom. Not necessarily the people in Samaria, but we care about his kingdom. Spirit of murder appears and justified through the scriptures. And we know Jesus' response. Have I got that next? No, I didn't put that next. Um, and Jesus said to them, you know not what spirit you're of. A murder of spirit is not the spirit of Christ. It's not the spirit of his kingdom. And they were trying to justify it through the Old Testament experiences. Isn't that interesting? Let's go back to the Old Testament. We'll justify being just as nasty as they were in the Old Testament. Yeah, but what about Jesus' life? No, 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 no. Don't worry about that. But what about in the Old Testament? Lessons for us. Yes, verse 55. And he turned and rebuked them and said, You know not what manner of spirit you're of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy lives but to save them. And they went to another village. Did Jesus have an answer to the problem in Samaria? Yeah, let's go somewhere else. We'll just go somewhere else for the night. That's easy. Sometimes it's easy. Just, okay, Lord, we didn't get what we thought we'd get. What else have you got on your plate for us? We'll just go somewhere else. We can do that. So, now to summarise, just to wrap this up. After the beautiful revelation of who Christ was from the Father, speaking to Peter, 
things began to unravel. They denied the cross experienced for Christ, for Christ, and by implication, for themselves. Because if something negative was going to happen to Christ, then it meant it was going to happen to them. Their whole world would be turned upside down, and they're like, whoa, no. Next, Christ, seeing the danger, reiterated the need to take up the cross. The cross is so important for us, brothers and sisters, in our own experience. Some of the tough trials that we go through are actually the, the, the cutting of, our, of, of us as gemstones. The cutting of us as gemstones. So one day when the light hits us, we're going to glisten with facets that we never believed could exist in our own lives. That's how good God is. The Father gave a personal testimony of Christ's sonship while they were also reminded of his upcoming death. Their ulterior motives in opposition to God's will led to unbelief and the inability to help those in need. Next, Jesus again reminds them of the fact that what they are denying will come to pass. That the cross is before them. It was going to happen. It was not going to go away. They were going to face it one way or another. Prepared or unprepared. We have crosses before us. We may not be prepared, or we can prepare through prayer, fasting, studying. They still refuse the lessons of humility and squabble about who's going to be the greatest. This is a bad spirit to have in our hearts. The spirit of dominance then came and overflowed from within their ranks to now target those around them who they perceived as their enemies. We've got to stop these guys. They're not with us. And finally, full-blown evil comes from their mouths as they desire to destroy those who didn't do things the way they wanted. They wanted to bring fire down and kill the Samaritans. The point here... Uh, no, one more point here. Finally, Jesus confronts their own thoughts on mission uh, and defending their faith with his own thoughts on mission and defending the faith. I am not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. His intention was that the disciples join him in his mission. And I could put in his way. How about us? Let us reflect upon our own experiences and see what lessons Jesus has for us as we prepare to face the cross in our lives. The little things back at the start of this sermon, and at the beginning in you know, Luke chapter five here, uh, chapter nine here, it didn't seem like too much. It was just a little thing, a little bit of a pushback against the cross. But as chapter nine unfolds, this little bit of a hardening of the heart at the start of chapter nine ends up as a murderous intent towards those that they feel are getting in the way of the gospel. That's not God's kingdom. The things we consider little and inconsequential, if not dealt with now, will lead to an outburst of evil in and through us that we didn't realize nor expect is within us. And so, brothers and sisters, I just encourage you, you, you know, you, we could take it a little bit negative, this sermon, or we could take it as really positive. Because did Jesus give up on the disciples? No. Did the Father give up on the disciples? No. Did the disciples come through the cross and meet Jesus after the resurrection? Yes. And so it was this experience that actually made them what they were going to be. Just like the original Adventists came through really tough experiences and made and learned precious lessons and beliefs that made us as Seventh-day Adventists what we are to be. And uh, I believe, as God's children, that he will continue to work in us. He will do what he's promised, and we can be part of it. Never give up. I encourage you, don't give up. Just keep, just go to the cross with Jesus. Don't try and take up your own cross. Accept Jesus' cross. Enter into his cross. And raise, be raised with him. Ephesians chapter 1. Ra be raised with Jesus. And what does it say further on in, in, in Ephesians 1? That we sit in heavenly places with him. When is that? Now. Now. We sit. Current. 
present tense. We sit now in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, thank you for your time together, and let's uh, just just kneel and have a prayer, eh? Gracious Father, we thank you for our walk through your word this morning because we've been able to walk with Jesus as he walked with the disciples. We've put our, ourselves in the place of the disciples and discovered we are no different to them. And in a sense, Lord, that is good news because it was the disciples that were converted and they were able to take the gospel message when they fully understood you and your kingdom. Father, I pray this will be our experience that we will understand you and that the messages that we share with the people that we meet day by day will be glorious and draw people to the cross and then raise them up in units of life, preparing for heaven. Bless us all to this end, I pray, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, everybody. God bless. Have a wonderful week. And we'll see everybody again in two weeks' time. Bye. Take you home